Oh, hi there. Thanks for joining me. I'm quite excited this morning since the ghost of Chemical Engineering Pass has agreed to come and have a chat and share some of his wisdom with us. Rather than go all the way to his favourite Belgian steelworks, he's making the trip back to the UK. He gave me the grid reference that I think I've just found, this old abandoned power station near Derby, and all I have to do now is to try and find him. Hello, old chap. You found me. Where are you? I can't see you. Oh, terribly sorry. It's taking me longer to materialise these days than it used to. I do hope you like our meeting place. It's great, yes. Thank you for the suggestion. And thank you for coming back to the UK for talking. Oh, about it's my pleasure. pleasure. It's nice to be back here. So, I know you've got limited time today, but I was hoping that you could answer two questions for me. Well, it does rather depend what those questions are, but I will try to. Thank you. Well, firstly, I was wondering if you could tell us how chemical engineers in your era managed to design all that complex plant equipment with either minimal or sometimes no computer assistance. It's something I do find quite remarkable. Oh, by all means, the long answer to that would be a day's conversation in its own right. But I'll try and explain the most important things for you. What is your second question? Great, thank you. My second question is what's the single most important thing that you've learnt and what wisdom from that would you pass on to the chemical engineer of today? Aha, well that's an easy question to answer. I'd like to start with answering that first if I may. Of course. So what is that all-important piece of wisdom you'd like to pass on? A sound and sensible approach to safety. Okay, could you expand on that a bit? Of course. I was lucky enough when I worked at ICI Billingham in the 1950s to become good friends with a wonderful chap called Trevor, Trevor Kletz. Trevor joined ICI as a chemist when I'd already been working at the Billingham site for a decade or so, but it wasn't in process chemistry that he made his name. After he had spent some years in our R&D department solving engineering problems, he went on to be one of the first technical safety advisors in the chemical industry, and he made a wonderful contribution. Over the course of his career, not only did he become an internationally recognised pioneer in process safety, but he reduced the fatal accident rate throughout the company by a factor of three. That's quite some achievement. Quite so. Could you give us a bit of insight into how Trevor managed to achieve this? I'll certainly do my best. My expertise was not as great as his, but I'd like to give you three things to think about. Great. So what's the first of these? The first is a response to members of management who may balk at the idea of paying for safety, and sadly some do, which is along the lines of, if you think safety is expensive, then try having an accident. It bewilders me how some managers fail to comprehend how expensive damage compensation, injury claims and loss of reputation are. One would hope that sensible safety precaution would be a moral and ethical duty, but when those things get pushed aside in favour of the triple bottom line, a reminder of how safety can impact the triple bottom line can be very timely. A very valid point, and given some of the past accidents that have happened in the chemical industry, one would hope that those lessons would be remembered. <laughs> I wouldn't rely on that, my dear fellow. Corporate memory can be short, and history has a habit of repeating itself. As Travi used to say when an accident recurred, don't write a report, I've got one on file already. Oh, right. So what is your second piece of safety wisdom? Well, again, it's not my wisdom, it's Trevor's, and it's a beautifully powerful concept. Powerful thanks to its simplicity, which is itself a lesson, and that is what you don't have can't leak. It's a concept that goes by the more formal name of inherent safety. Inherent safety? Could you expand on that a bit more? Certainly. It comes down to the fundamental premise of avoiding hazards. It can apply during design, during operations, and as a culture more generally. If you don't have something dangerous, then it cannot cause harm. What you don't have can't leak. One example would be to reduce the amount of hazardous materials stored on site. This can either be a reduction in raw material storage, product storage, or the kind of intermediate storage that you <coughs> see on plants to buffer material flows. Wasn't the world's worst chemical accident due, in part, to unnecessary intermediate storage being designed into a flow sheet? Quite so. A tragedy. And so avoidable. The concept can, of course, be extended beyond reducing material inventories. Can a less hazardous chemical, or set of chemistry, be used to make a product? We've seen how hydrogen cyanide was used as a reagent to make the monomer for perspex, methyl methacrylate. 
I do believe that innovations in catalysis, long after I left the industry, meant that methyl methacrylate could be manufactured by a different route, one that doesn't involve hydrogen cyanide? Yes, that's very true. Lucite's alpha process revolutionised the safety and production of perspex. Ah, a good example. Another way in one can which make a process route safer is to avoid exothermic reactions. It's far easier for these reactions to run away and cause a problem compared to, for example, endothermic reactions that will self-extinguish. But always keep an eye on the overall safety level since, for example, some endothermic reactions need so much energy input they have to take place in a gas-fired furnace, which has a different set of hazards associated with it. OK, so accidents are expensive, inherent safety is good. What is your third piece of safety advice? Build a constructive safety culture. That sounds like one of those things that's easy to say but quite hard to do. No, no, not really. I'll give you one example. Don't blame people for accidents. Make recommendations to avoid them. I can remember that Trevor used to be seething when management attributed an accident to human error and pointed the finger of blame at some poor unfortunate soul on the operations team. He used to say that to blame human error for an accident is akin to blaming gravity for someone falling downstairs. I might have misunderstood, but surely accidents are based on human error. My dear fellow, all accidents, not some accidents, are human error. Saying that something is human error fails to address what kind of error it was and what the remedy is. Was it a mistake? Is the remedy to give better training? Was it a violation? In other words, someone not wanting to do something due to poor motivation. In that case, what is the cause of the poor motivation? Has there been a mismatch between a person's ability and a task? One cause for this is the individual concerned was so overloaded with work that they were unable to concentrate fully on the task that led to the accident. The key is not to try to change people, but to change the environment. Better design, better methods of working, better training, better inspection, and so on and so forth. As Trevor used to say, blaming human error diverts attention on from what might be done by better engineering. Those are very wise words. I get the impression that, all too often, it is easier for managers to blame rather than to remedy. Quite so. One way to ensure that you do not stray into this behaviour trait as you progress into positions of management is to say the following things to yourself. 1. I can commit the same mistakes as everyone else. We all make mistakes. We are not able to avoid making mistakes, no matter which social position we are in. 2. I am just as vulnerable and just as valuable as everyone else. Life, health, desires and property of individuals have a value and deserve protection. I do not have the right to pursue my success at the expense of others. No one has the right to minimise their faults and maximise their desires on the basis of his or her position. A safety culture spans an entire organisation. No one is exempt from it. For example, if there has been an accident or incident and you phone senior management to report it, listen carefully to the first question that they ask. Is it, was anyone hurt? Or is it, when are you going to be back online? If it's the latter, you know you don't need better operators or safety engineers, you need better directors. Thank you. Yes, those are valuable comments and insights. I'm very grateful for you sharing them with us. My pleasure. So, on to that second question. Tell us how chemical engineers in your era managed to design all that complex plant equipment with either minimal or sometimes no computer assistance. I'm afraid that a short answer will be needed though, as we're running a little tight on time now. By all means, no problem. In many ways, it's a simple question to answer. It's all about understanding the problem, realising those bits of a problem that are important and those bits that we can safely neglect. The skill of a good engineer is to quickly figure out what's important in a problem and to focus in on that. We'd have loved to have had access to the calculating machines that you have in your era. They are simply amazing pieces of technology. The danger is, though, that over-reliance on black-box computer programs tend to dull one's insight into, and understanding of, a problem. Even in my day, when computers were a nascent technology, I saw many examples of young engineers spending weeks coding a problem in all its physical glory, only to have an experienced engineer make some key assumption using physical insight and solve the core of the problem to about 95% accuracy within roughly half a day. Well, I'm pretty sure that you can't teach experience, but are there techniques and approaches that can be used to help gain the sort of insight that you're alluding to? There are two key things that run hand in hand to a point. Good experiments or scale models and sensible use of dimensionless groups. To the uninitiated, dimensional analysis seems like an archaic tool, but actually it is of great use. 
chemical engineers use lots of different dimensionless groups that give physical insight into a problem. For example, the Schmidt number is the ratio of the kinematic viscosity to the diffusion coefficient, and the Nusselt number is the ratio of the rate of heat convective heat transfer to the rate of conductive heat transfer in a process, and so on and so forth. If the Nusselt number is large, then you know that you need to worry predominantly about convective heat transfer, and that diffusive heat transfer is a second-order effect. OK, I see where you're going with this. You're saying that if you can understand what dimensionless groups govern a problem and calculate the values, you can get an idea of the dominant physical effects in a process. Quite so. That concept can be extended to making physical models of a process too. Consider, for example, the fluidized catalytic cracker that I mentioned when talking about refinery operations. It's a huge piece of equipment with many complex coupled physical processes going on. I believe that even using your huge computers, it isn't possible yet to design them from first principles. Well, I believe it is possible to couple computational fluid dynamics to discrete element methods to simulate fluidized beds of tens or hundreds of thousands of particles. Yes, 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 but tens of billions of particles coupled with heat transfer, mass transfer, reaction kinetics and fluid dynamics. Don't forget that the first fluid cat cracker was commissioned halfway through World War II, just two years after Alan Turing's first mechanical computer to break the Nazi Enigma code was built and successfully run at Bletchley Park. Right, OK, that's quite some feat. How on earth did you do it? Well, physical scale models were a key part of the design process. The design of these models was informed through dimensional analysis. We aim for something called dynamic and geometric similarity. That is to say, a physical scale model where the key non-dimensional groups take the same values as they would in the full-size unit, so long as the key groups, such as the Froud, Reynolds, Nussel, Sherwood, Prantl, Weber and Schmidt numbers, amongst others, were the same at both scales, then we had some confidence that the key physical phenomena were going to be similar. Of course, we used a number of scale models, each one bigger than the last, before committing hundreds of millions of pounds to build a full unit. That must have been a very time-consuming process. Oh, it was. Designs took a number of years to reach fruition, but they still do, don't they? Yes, that's very true. Well, I think we'd better wrap up there, and you've given me some good ideas about what to teach next. I really do appreciate you coming here today and spending some time sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really it is. Now, I must bid you farewell, since I have to go and sort out a safety problem brewing in the chemical engineering of the future. Wait. Oh, he's already faded and gone. Well, I hope you found that useful. The key messages of safety first and understand the problem you're solving sound like very solid pieces of advice to me. I think what we'll do next is spend a little time exploring dimensional analysis in a little more detail, since the insight it can give you into a problem seems to me to be just as valid in our computer-dominated profession as it was when slide rules ruled. I'd better go. See you next lecture.